I just, I just do not recommend soap whatsoever. Um, you know, as long as you could take that line, strip it into a, a, a nice clean uh, bucket of water, just straight water, um, and then grab a, a dry rag and run it through the rag, and you'll see the dirt come right off it. And then after that, when the line's dry, that's when I put the line cleaning uh, rejuvenator, which is a silicone wipe over the top of it. It seals out dirt, adds a little bit of slickness to it, and, and you're good to go. That was Brooks Robinson with a little pro tip on cleaning the old fly line. This is the fly line episode number 171 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you get a chance, uh, please head over to wetflyswing.com slash O2. That's, uh, that is O2, the letter O2, uh, for the out- Outdoors Online Marketing Podcast. This is the other podcast where we're digging into more more of the business side, the online marketing side of, of fly fishing. So uh, check it out today. Brooks Robinson from Cortland Line is here to shed some light on choosing your next fly line. We dig into the history of Cortland Line and what they have going today. Talk about the best dry line uh, that they have going, and uh, and also swing into tarpon a little on euro nymphing and spay. I think we just about covered it all today, including a little bit on Leon Chandler, who was a big uh, person for Cortland back in the day. We talk about how they've swung um, over the last hundred years as a company and all the history there. Before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to thank our sponsors. SoFly Gear, headed up by 17-year-old James Carlin of the U.S. Youth Fly Fishing Team, has a buttery, soft, quick-drying apparel line that I've been loving. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash SoFly and support James and the podcast today. So without further ado, here is Brooks Robinson from CourtenLine.com. How's it going, Brooks? Good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on today. We're gonna dig into uh, some information on fly lines. You know, obviously, uh, Cortland's been in the game for a while, and uh, we're gonna talk about that. And I, I've been, I've known Cortland for quite some time as well. But uh, before we get there, maybe we just talk about how you first got into fly fishing, and then how you brought that into uh, Cortland. Yeah, so I grew up. Uh, I was actually born in Cortland, New York, where the Cortland office and factory is located. Um, I grew up about. 10 minutes north of there in a small town called Tully, New York. Uh, I grew up on a small little private lake, so I've fished my whole life. Um, obviously, a lot of my family has fished too, so I really got into, you know, spin fishing, conventional fishing, fly fishing with my father and my uh, my grandfather. And, uh, you know, I've really just, I, I've, I've always loved it. Um, it's always been, a, you know, a part of me, a part of our family. Um you know, and right, right through high school, college, I always fished. We, we have a lot of great fisheries here in upstate New York. Um, we're not too far from saltwater. Um, so it's, it's a very cool place to live, whether you're, you know, targeting wild trout, uh, lake run fish, um, you know, and the saltwater stuff, like I mentioned before. So, um, it's, it's been a, a great ride. I'm 33 years old. Like I said, I've fished my whole life. Um, I think I was out of college, uh, maybe for a couple years and, uh, a gentleman had sent me a text when I was jumping on a drift boat to go steelhead fishing and said, Hey, you want a job? And I said, <laughs> yeah, I didn't even know what it was for. Um, and two days later I was working at Cortland line in the factory, uh, making fly line. So <laughs> that's really how I started at Cortland was working in the manufacturing plant, uh, making fly line for a few years. And then, eventually just worked my way up through sales, uh, where I'm at today. Oh, wow. And who, and that guy that asked you, uh, is he still, uh, was he Cortland? Was he a, a rep or something? So, uh, his name is Joe Goodspeed and he's the head fly rod designer at Thomas and Thomas. Um, and we're still great friends and, uh, yeah, he, he had an opening. Um, we were actually just friends on Facebook. Uh, obviously we had fished some of the same waters around in upstate New York. So we just kind of you know, knew each other really through social media. And, uh, I, that's really how it started. Um, you know, and I've been there for about eight or nine years and, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been an awesome ride so far. 
That's right. So eight or nine years. And yeah, so you're fairly, uh, you know, not a newbie. You've been there a while. But as far as Cortland's concerned, I mean, there's a huge history of what, like um, 80 more years right on top of that that Cortland's been around? Uh, since 1915, actually. 19, um, 1950. So yeah. over, over, yeah, over 100 years. Yeah, it's a long history. And uh, it started as a sporting goods company. Um and it had morphed into uh, actually making products for World War II um, with all the braiders that we have. Um, you know, it went from braiding silk fly lines and, you know, conventional braid, switching over to uh, boot laces, bomb cord, parachute cord uh, for the wartime effort. And, um, you know, once that was over, it had gone back to sporting goods, whether, uh, you know, again, it was braided silk lines for fly fishing, uh, braided lines for conventional fishing, and then right up through to the PVC fly line era. So it's, it's, it's gone through a lot of phases, but all, uh, all very cool phases. If you know, you're into the, the history of fishing, uh, regardless if it's fly fishing or conventional. Yeah, and, and and that's the cool thing, Cortland. I mean, you, and it's still in your um, in your name, I guess, in the website, right? Cortlandline dot com. It's uh, you know, I mean, the the lines have always been a big part of it. Uh, you know, when you look at back, you, if you look now and you look at the history, I mean, is Cortland is the line still the the most uh, is the biggest product you guys have? Absolutely, uh, fly line number one. Uh, the conventional braid, we make some incredible, uh, solid braid and hollow core braid, uh, for the offshore market. Um, you know, we do, do a handful of rods and, and reels, but you know, by far fly line, uh, you know, and, and sprinkle in the backing and the leaders and tippet as well. Gotcha. Okay. So, so yeah, yeah. I mean the history, I, I guess it's pretty straightforward 1950 and they're probably, I mean, Orvis was around They're Probably, I mean, were there any other companies that are still around back then uh, in the fly fishing space man um i'm sure there was a couple that have come and gone you yeah. know maybe um, maybe daddy uh maybe daddy flies but i'm not sure if they yeah. yeah yeah i mean they were you know the original cat skill fly yeah a, a program you know they're they they really started that whole fishery in the cat skills with you know all the people that would come up from new york city back in the day um yeah that was that was long before those dams were created on the east and west branch, which are now famous for being tailwaters. Um, you know, but that's really how it all started, you know. Um, uh, but yeah, I'd say, you know, probably Orvis was was one of the original ones back in the day that's still around. Um and and like I said, I'm sure there's some that are are still around that that I can't think of yeah. right now. Yeah, cool. Well, I remember, uh, you know, I'm a little bit older than you, and I, I grew up around a fly shop and remember the Cortland, you know, obviously the 444 uh, was a line that I've used most of my life. I remember when I was a kid, we sold the Cortland lines um, and Orvis, you know, I mean, those are the two companies for a small shop. Cortland was big. I mean, I had I had tons of Cortland stuff. And um and it's really cool to see now because it feels like to me, I mean, I'm, I haven't, I don't know the whole history from like the eighties up until now, but it seems like, you know, Cortland was everywhere and then maybe Cortland wasn't everywhere. And now it seems like you guys are getting back to everywhere. Can you, can you talk about the recent history? And I mean, am I off there or has Cortland just been plugging along, kicking out lines the whole time? No, you're absolutely correct. I mean, um, you know, Cortland was, you know, one of the main brands there right through um, for a while. Uh, when I had started, it was really um, the beginning of this recent uptick, um, you know, in the popularity of the brand. Which was like 2010, right? Somewhere in that range? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there was a lot of management changes, both in the office and in the in the plant, Um you know, quality has always been our number one focus, but also being innovative over the years, you know, which has really put us back on the map. Um, I think we do a great job. You know, we have an excellent sales force. We have a very strong social media presence um, as well as website, which, you know, goes a long way in today's age. Um, but, yeah, it's 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 been a journey even in my nine years there. Um, like I said, I, I really started right at, as the company was starting to get back under, you know, on, on its feet. Um, so it's, I, I, there's been even management changes since I've been there, but you know, since the last five or six years, our president, John Wilson took over, um, our VP of sales, Richard Stewart, uh, 
just in, in incredible businessmen, um, fishermen, um, and, and they just, they really know the business well. And we've put together an excellent team to really get Cortland back on track to where it was, like you mentioned, you know, back in the seventies and eighties. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And I guess you can attribute that period wherever there was that little down, just probably some changes in, uh, staff and management, whatever it was. But I mean, you guys, uh, I mean now, I mean, what, what's the, what's putting you guys on the map? Obviously you're still kicking out these lines, but you hear about the Euro nipping, you hear about some of this saltwater stuff. I mean, what do you think is the, what's the hot product right now? Is there something in the fly fishing space that really is, is out there and really kind of banging? No, I mean, you hit it right there. I mean, the, the Euro nymphing stuff, you know, it's, it's just being at the forefront of whatever, uh, is new. Um, you know, as far as what's, what's the next craze, um, we've done an exceptional job with the Euro nymphing stuff. Um, you know, both with the, the Euro nymphing rods, the, the, the awesome fluorocarbon tip that we have, the Euro nymph fly lines, um, as well as the saltwater stuff. Uh, I mean, our clear liquid crystal is a very unique top selling, uh, full clear floating saltwater fly line. Um, uh, we do extremely well with that, you know, especially for the tarpon fishery down in Florida. Um, you know, and then with the recent addition of the GT tuna line that we introduced a few years ago. Uh, we worked on that line with the guys from Alphonse Fishing Company. Um, GT Fishing has been really cool as far as, you know, just being a, a, a travel destination type species. It's an, it's an incredible fish to target. Um, and, you know, just, just making lines that can hold up to the, the wear and tear that those fish put on your gear. Um, but, yeah, the Euro nymphing stuff's been crazy. Obviously, trout fishing is always number one, just, just generally speaking. Um you know, and just coming out with great new stuff, you know, as well for the saltwater uh, mm -hmm. fishery. That's right. Yeah, maybe if we have time, we'll talk, touch on that. I've got a uh, potentially a tarpon trip coming up uh, next year, early next year. So I'm excited to maybe talk to you guys about uh, making sure I have, uh, you know, the right light and stuff. But, um, but yeah, I mean, so let me go back real quick to history. So who was, do you know that the founder, who was the actual founder of the company? Founder was Ray Smith. Okay. Ray Smith and and he and he uh, founded it and then kind of that moved along through it wasn't like a a family thing um did that kind of move along to other owners it it did i think he was the main owner for a while um it is a privately owned company now it was an employee owned company oh, for okay. a long time um yeah. i believe there's been maybe about six presidents um since 1915 um you know, and some incredible vice presidents, including Leon Chandler, who really put, you know, Cortland on the map through those years. Um, I, I believe he was the president of Trout Unlimited for a long time. Oh, yeah. Uh, so he was the VP at Cortland, um, you know, and that guy would just travel all year long and just, you know, really speak to the Cortland name. And I mean, he was everywhere, Montana, overseas, Japan, the UK, um, he was, you know, he was what social media is today yeah. for, Quentin, you know, and there was no email back then. There was no Internet back then. So you really had to have boots on the ground. And, and he was that guy for Cortland, um, you know, and that's that's what we're, we're trying to do today is basically replicate what he did for so many years for the brand. That's right. Who is is there somebody? So there's not somebody in Cortland or like how many people do you have working for Cortland right now? Probably about 30. Yeah, um, so 30, good both, shot. Both in the office and in the plant, you know, and that doesn't account for, you know, our independent sales force, our, our sales reps. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good crew that's in there. I mean, it's a big facility. I and mean, you're, you're manufacturing fly line, manufacturing braided lines, um, as well as all the spooling, the packaging, the labeling. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a team effort to, to make things move. Yeah. Is there anybody, um, I mean, who was the name you said, the, the character that, um, back in the day? Leon Chandler. And Leon, and what era was that? Um, I believe he passed away in the nineties. Okay. Yeah. So, um, he, so he was there during that. Yeah. The eight seventies, eighties, nineties. I mean, probably even, you know, the, the definitely the sixties, seventies, eighties, you know, right. Maybe in the early nineties, but you know, he was, he was Cortland line. Um, yeah. for a long time. Is, is there, and there's not a Leon Chandler similar person around the office these days. It's definitely a team effort now, um, you know, to, to make up for what he had done for so many years. Um, 
you know, there's a group of us at the office. We do all the trade shows. You know, it's a team effort on social media, product development. Um, yeah, I would definitely say there's a, a group of, you know, four, five, or six super fishy guys that work at the office every single day. And, uh, you know, that's what really keeps us moving along, um, you know, with with the addition of, you know, some of our ambassadors and our pro staff that really help on the product development side, as well as, um, you know, helping out at trade shows as well. It's uh, it's absolutely a team effort that's, uh, you know, helped Cortland move back to where it once was. Mm hmm. Nice. Yeah, I say, yeah, and where it is now, I mean, there's definitely plenty of competition out there. I mean, I was just recently, uh, you know, I, well, I talked to, you know, almost every week, somebody that's around the, the fly line company. I mean, there's uh, a number of them out there, but how do you guys, I mean, it, it, what is the, is there one thing you, you kind of attribute to your success to now? And, and because it is pretty competitive market, right? Yeah, it's very competitive. I mean, there's just so many more brands that pop up. And, um, I just think with the internet and social media, it's, you know, it's easy to start a brand. I don't want to say it's easy, but there's a lot of, um, well, the one thing is that there isn't a lot of line, co- you know, I mean, there's a ton of rod companies. Like you could think of a bunch, hundreds probably of companies, people sure. that have started rod companies, but you can't think of that with lines and why, why do you, or maybe you can, is, is there a bunch of random kind of low uh, names you wouldn't have heard of in the line company? It, um, that manufacture their own. No. Um, there's really only a handful of manufacturers in the world, um, you know, which makes it a unique business to be in, um, especially, you know, just the, the fly line side of it and, and the conventional side with the braid. Oh yeah. Do you guys manufacture, um, to talk about that just briefly, because I'm not sure if you know all the, but I know like scientific anglers, right. They, I think they manufacture lines for other companies, like maybe Orbis and things like that. Do you guys, are you your own, um, manufacturing company? plant or maybe just talk about that a little bit correct we uh have all the machines right in the Cortland facility that manufacture our own fly lines um i'd say there's probably a couple other manufacturers in the u.s um uk canada and i'm sure there might be one or two overseas but um you know as far as quality stuff i mean the majority of the quality stuff that's offered in the world is done right here in the u.s um which is pretty neat um you know, like you mentioned before, there there are a lot of rod companies out there. There there aren't that many rod companies, you know, in the in, in the U.S. that um, you know are really rolling their own own blanks and uh, you know putting on their own guides, cork and 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 whatnot. So um, you know, it is neat to to be one of only few manufacturers in the world that are producing the fly lines. Um, you know, as well as the braid, um, you know, braiding our own backing core right in our own facility. And the conventional stuff, I mean, it is a a unique process and it definitely helps us, you know, set us apart a little bit just because we can tweak and change things, um, you know, right from the inside out of every detail of the fly line from start to finish. Um, You know, and I I think that that really helps us, um, you know, set ourselves apart from some other brands and, uh, you know, makes us unique in, in some ways. Yeah, totally. So yeah, maybe we can just jump into a, a little bit on the like how to choose a line. I mean, there's probably uh, it seems like it's pretty straightforward, but l- let's dig into that. And I guess maybe just think of stick on trout because that's probably what a lot of people are doing. All, although nowadays people are into all sorts of species, but you know what, what do people? Uh, well, let's start off first. Let's not think about the trout. Let's just think about somebody needs to buy a line. Um, what should they be thinking about when they get a line? You know, what, what's the first thing to think about? First things thinking about when you're purchasing a fly line is, you know, number one, what, what are you going to use it for? Um, you know, what is your ultimate goal? What is the species that you're targeting? You know, what are the flies that you need to throw um, on that on that fly line to catch the species that you're targeting? Um, Can we do a, a trout dry fly fishing? I think we're, we're throwing some dry flies. Sure. Um, you know, dry fly fishing, I mean, number one, you really would, you know, want a, a somewhat delicate presentation line. Um, you know, places like the Catskills, there's a lot of uh, slicked out calm water with rising fish and, and having, a, you know, an aggressive overweighted fly line. While it might shoot really well, um, the, the water disturbance slamming the water, you know, might put fish down. So, you know, if I'm if I'm targeting fish for for, you know, the dry fly scene, 
you know, I'm going to go with uh, a longer front tapered fly line um, that dissipates energy through the fly line into the leader. Um, just a, a general delicate type presentation line. And it, and it also can depend on the size flies that you're throwing. Um, I mean, if you're throwing, you know, trichos, midges, small, small BWOs, um, that's a little bit different of a line than if you're throwing, you know, big Drake patterns or even hoppers. Um, so th there is a lot to think about when it comes to even just a, a, a fly line choice for dry fly fishing. Um, and it can also depend on the length of the leader that you're going to throw. Um, you know, smaller streams definitely can get away with shorter leaders. Um, larger rivers, you know, you want a little bit of a longer leader. Um, you know, and it depends on how pressured your fishery is too. Um, you know, if you have really smart tailwater fish versus maybe a stream that has some stocked fish in it, or, you know, uh, you know, long, slow moving deeper pools versus some faster riffles. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it can dictate the line you choose as well as your leader setup you know, right down to the tippet that you need to, to fool that fish. So there's definitely a lot to go into it. I mean, there are some general things that you can stick to to make sure that you, you know, have somewhat of a ideal choice going forward with the right fly line. But I mean, you can get super techie with it. I mean, I, I choose lines, you know, and I speak to customers, you know, I really get down into, you know, what is it that you're throwing? What is it, you know, what are the fish you're targeting? What are they going to be eating? Um, you know, and, and there's so many fly lines out there, but they all do serve a purpose. What's your home water there? My home water is by far the Delaware system. So, um, so the Delaware, is there some decent dry fly fishing there? It is a lot of traditional stuff. Um, so what would be, if you just take us to the river there, if, I don't know if it's the Delaware, if you want to talk about a specific river, but let's just focus on that if we have one uh, first and then talk about you know, the type of fishing and then what dry line, uh, you might be choosing for that. Sure. Sure. So the Delaware system, um, mainly the two most popular, uh, waterways on that whole system, there's, there's probably about four or five rivers together that, that really group into that Delaware Catskill system. Um, the East and the West branch of the Delaware are the most popular. Those have two giant, um, dams, tailwater releases. Uh, it's really the New York city watershed, um, is is the reason why those exist there but they're uh <clears throat> they make a tailwater system and those fish become very selective on the bugs that um you know are, are in the water and you you really have to have a dialed pattern you cannot just go out and throw any old dry fly on those waterways um it's a very pressured uh river system because it is so popular um long leaders 12 15 foot leaders you know, five, six, seven X tippet. Um, I personally like to use the, uh, trout series, the ultralight It has an 18 foot front taper. Um, it lays out cast very nicely. Uh, you know, I think it has about a 42 foot total head design. So you can carry line at a good distance. Um, you really have to be a good caster to fish there, um, to, to be productive there. And then it's, um, some other streams that are in the mix, the beaver kill, which is the, you know, has, has a ton of history there. The Willow Weemock, which goes into the beaver kill. Those are both free stones. Um, fish aren't as picky. Bug life is equal, um, except those rivers tend to get a little too warm by July and August. So, um, you know, you really have to know the systems there, what you're fishing, um, and, and the bug life. There is a cycle of mayflies through there. Um, you know, caddis, black stones, early black stones, you know, in, in February and March. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a very cool place to fish. And then all those rivers combine and make the main stem of the Delaware, um, in the, in the town of Hancock and that main stem of the Delaware, I mean, it goes right down all the way through, you know, into Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously the trout, you know, on the main stem, they're, they're down quite a ways, um, on the border water of New York and Pennsylvania, but that's a very big, wide, slow moving river. Um, you know, you have to target those fish when they're feeding on top, you know, you have to lay a cast out well upstream of them and, and feed and stack mm -hmm. men line down to them. Um, you know, or, or the reverse approach and throw straight, you know, at an angle upstream at them. So, um, they're very picky. They're super smart. They're definitely pressured. I like, like I said, the ultralight line, mm -hmm. 
And then I also like the Trout Boss line. It's a shorter taper. It's about a 32-foot head design. It's a little more aggressive. I like that line for bigger bugs such as uh, Drake's, March Browns, um, or when it's windy. Um, that river, uh, it, it's you can almost guarantee it's windy pretty much two out of three days. It's not as windy as it is out west, but you know, you've got a, a 10, 15 mile an hour upstream breeze um, throwing a 15 foot leader, it's very hard to fish. So those are my two, two ideal choices for fly lines, you know, when it comes to dry fly fishing and the ultralight, um, calmer conditions, smaller bugs and the trout boss, uh, you know, bigger bugs and, and, and some windy conditions. How does that compare to the, either of those two lines to the Cortland, the 444? What what is the 444? And is it that this is that the same line as it was back in the 80s? It it is it is. So the 444 is a series. The original line in that series was the 444 Peach line. Um, it's a supple fly line. It's about a 30 foot head design. It's a true line size. Um, you know, it works on pretty much everyone's rods. It's a bulletproof fly line. Is it a uh, double taper or a weight forward? We sell both a weight forward and a double taper in that line. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and then and then we have a ton of other lines in that 444 series. The SL was a very popular line, still is. It's a, a longer head design. Um, and then we have some newer lines in that series, such as the Modern Trout, which is an aggressive line, a half size heavy for some of the faster rods. So we really cater to a wide range of of rods. Um, as you know, there's, you know, there's moderate fast rods, there's really fast rods, there's glass rods, there's bamboo rods. Yeah. And, um, you know, you have to know what type of rod you have in order to pair it up with the correct line. Yeah. Um, that's a good, you know, and that can point. be tricky. It can be tricky for guys that are just getting into it. Um, but what if somebody has got, um, you know, whatever random rod in their thing right now they need a line can they is there a place like a resource on your site or somewhere where they can say you know here's with the rod i got here's the Cortland line i need yeah definitely i mean the number one thing we ask guys to do is just send us an email to info at courtlandline.com let us know what rod you have um we're well versed in pretty much all the brands that are out there um you know you have rods you know like thomas and thomas and scott rods they're phenomenal rods they're a little true to size so we recommend true fly line sizes where you know you get into some rods you know let's say from sage or hardy or g loomis they're a little bit faster they may require you know a half size heavy fly line or even a full size heavy fly line so you know if if, if we have customers that are curious if you just let us know what rod you have. We're, we're probably going to be able to pair you up correctly um, with the wide range of fly lines that we offer. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that would be cool. Just thinking out loud to have some sort of a like a. Um, obviously, talking to you guys, it sounds like that's easy to do, but it would be cool to have some sort of a like a PDF right online where it's like here in one column is your rod that you have, and then the other column is the species you fish for, and then you line those up in the middle and that's the Cortland line you need. Right. Or, um, you know, I guess for Cortland, but there's probably all, all sorts of nuances around that where you can't really you can't, it's not that straightforward. It, it, I, I wish it was cause it would make life easy for a lot of guys getting into it. Um, you know, and there's, there's variations within rods for each company. I mean, each of those companies also makes, you know, a more classic taper, uh, that fits a true line size or a fast taper, uh, rod that, that might, you know, need a half size or a full size heavy. So there's so many rods out there, even within, you know, a handful of companies. Um, yeah, it would be tricky and I, I yeah. wish it was, I wish it was a little easier, but, um, you know, that's why we just ask, you know, let us know what rod you have and, and we'll get you set up. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'm always thinking of, you know, as somebody's listening here, just as a resource, kind of an evergreen thing, you know, and I think obviously you guys will be there uh, to answer questions and, um, and all that. So, okay, cool. Well, I think we got a good feel for it. The 444, the peach was the one. Yeah, I remember plenty of the, the peaches coming through. And, you know, in fact, I don't know if I still have one of those, but I still have one of the Cortland, um, the rim fly, right? The rim fly reel. The, you had the crowns and all that stuff. I mean, what are the reels? So you guys, maybe just talk briefly about that because I know you guys still do some reels. Do you still have, um, you know, uh, any of the, that stuff? And then also, isn't there a fair play? Do you guys have a, a fair play series or something like that? Yeah, so to the reels, um, Cortland's had a wide range of reels for uh, decades. Uh, you know, the crown reels, the classics, uh, the yeah. rim flies. You know, uh, at one point we had owned the STH Reel Company. That's right. Uh, 
you know, which we no longer do. But yeah, there's there's tons of court owned reels still out there on the market. Um, right now, we just offer we have the uh, new Crown Series reels that we introduced last year um, in a Crown 3.5 and a 5.7. It's just two small trout reels that we offer right now. And we also have the, um, the, the fair play series, like you mentioned before, um, you know, that's, that's a whole series of, you know, lines, leaders, tippets, combo outfits, um, accessories. That's for the beginner. 100%. It's an entry level price point. Um, you know, with flies, uh, it's got everything you need, uh, bamboo nets, chest packs. All right. Is it with a 444 line? No, it is not. It has its own fair play line series. And how is that fair play line? How is that different from the 444 peach, say? Just quality of jacket. Um, plus the 444 peach, you know, has a front welded loop. Uh, it's, it's a little easier, you know, obviously the loop to loop connection yeah. on your gotcha. leader. So, um, but we sell the, the, the braided uh, slip on leader loops with the, the fair play lines. Um, yep. I believe it's, you know, it's, it's under $30. So, I mean, it's, it's made right in Cortland, like the rest of our yeah. lines. It's a great quality line. I mean, it's it's an awesome series if you're getting into it, not really sure what you're doing, but you know, stuff that's quality and it's going to function and you're going to have a great time on the water. Um, you know, it's our goal to make sure that you have a great time on the water and graduate into the summer uh, some of the other, you know, a little bit more expensive items, you know, as you become a better angler. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Okay. Well, anything else? I mean, as far as choosing a line, you know, obviously we were talking about trout there a little bit. I mean, any other general tips that you want to talk about before we move into maybe another species? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of ways, you know, to target trout. Um, streamer fishing is very popular. Uh, indicator nymphing and Euro nymphing, um, you know, uh, aside from the dry fly stuff. What is your most popular line uh, right now? Uh, I'd still say it's the 444 peach. Oh, really? Absolutely. Amazing. Uh, Amazing. That line does extremely well in the U.S. It does extremely well internationally. Um, like I said, it's a it's a bulletproof line. It works on pretty much everyone's rods. Everyone's had great success with it for, you know, what, 40, 50 years or so. Isn't that amazing? Because it, it just shows you. With all this stuff going, I know you guys are kind of lead. You got the Euro stuff going, which is amazing. You got some of this saltwater stuff, all this amazing stuff, which I'm super excited about. But at the end of the day, the 444 is still killing it. And it's probably just because everybody in the business knows that line. Everybody, yeah, I mean, right? If, if it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> you know, and guys that, you know, uh, again, as, as rods have slowly become a little bit faster, you know, over 30, 40 years, um, just with, with the materials that are available, um, you know, we've had to adjust in some line designs, whether it's a little more aggressive or, you know, maybe it's a little more overweighted. But the majority of the stuff that's still out there, um, I mean, that peach line just works. It fits rods well, um, you know, and, and guys love it. And like yeah. I said, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And yeah. that's why they continue to buy those lines year in and year that's out. Cool. Is the double taper now? I know there's not as many people buying those these days, but I I remember I used to love that thing because you you do the double taper, it's pretty light and all that stuff, good for trout, especially in close, and then you could flip it around. I mean, are you guys still selling some of those? And what's the percentage versus the, the other? Just your normal more weight forward. Weight forwards are definitely more popular. Um, I think that the that there's definitely a, a double taper craze with the older generation. I think it's kind of coming back around a little bit. And what is the double taper? Can you just explain that? So there's probably some new some new uh, ki kids on here listening that probably don't even know what a double taper is. Sure. So I'll start with the weight forward design. But basically, you know, you have a front taper, um, you have a level body, and then a rear taper and into the running line. And what that does is it helps shootability. Um, so when you go to shoot that line, um, the rear uh, the running line is thinner than the head portion, so it goes through the guides easier. The double taper has uh, a front taper a long level body all, all the way through the fly line and then basically a front taper on the other end. Um, you know, so what that does is, is it, it's not great for shootability compared to a weight forward design. Um, it's a little bit better for roll casting um, as well as you can take that line and flip it around and basically have a brand new fly line that's been, you know, yeah. uh, you know, looped in and connected to your backing for, for a season. Um, 
so that's that's what's nice. You kind of get you know uh, a couple seasons you know out of the same fly line. Uh, again, there's a trade off between doing that and then having a line that shoots a little bit better. But um, we offer the double taper in um, you know the the four forty four series as well as the, the the trout boss has a double taper uh, in the mix there too. So um, mm. oh really okay there. Um, but yeah, there's guys love double tapers still. I mean. It's, you know, it's, it's preference. Um, but yeah, there's obviously a little, a little trade off there in, in terms of taper and performance. How do you know when, um, you know, that's a great tip, you know, f- double taper flipping around twice the life, but just on a normal line, how do you know when, uh, you need a new line? I mean, if you keep your lines clean, you know, that's the w- one thing we always tell guys to do. Um, you know, when it, it depends on the water you're fishing too. Some water is very clean. You don't need to clean it as much you know, versus some really dark water, some dirty ponds, um, you know, it depends on how you store your fly line. Um, you know, it, over time that line will get dirty. If you can re- rejuvenate it, keep it clean with some clean water. Um, you know, maybe the, the silicone cleaning pads that we offer gives it a little bit more life. Um, I mean, over time it, it, it is, it is plastic. It will break down over time. I mean, you're going to know, you know, it depends on how much you fish too. Um, and the, and the species that you're targeting and the wear and tear on that line. If somebody sent you a line right now, if I sent you one of my old lines and mailed it to you and gave it to you, could you look at that line and be like, you know, know pretty much how, how much life it's got left before I need a new line? I mean, it's just, is it just the cracking? Is that what you're looking at? Yeah, it's, it's that, um, you know, that's, that's the biggest thing is that you can see the breakdown of, of the line over time through, through the cracking, um, but for the yeah. most part, I mean, if that thing's still together, yeah, it's going to work great. Now, like I said, clean it, give it, you know, give it the, the silicone lubricant, um, adds a little bit of dressing to it, makes it a little slicker. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it depends on the species. If you're catching 12 inch trout all day versus, you know, big salmon and steelhead, the stress put on that fly line, um, you know, really dictates the the breakdown and the wear and tear over time. Yeah. Um, that's right. You know, or, or pike musky, tarpon versus, you know, bluegill and panfish. There's there's quite a bit of difference, um, you know, in, in, in the wear and tear on that line. So yeah. that's the biggest thing. That's right. And something, you know, people maybe don't think about, but you know, like casting, right? I mean, that's the thing with the line. It may seem kind of okay, but, you know, is there a big difference in the castability of a line if it's just a little bit older, you know, or, or is... You know, once it starts cracking and losing that gloss, does that affect your casting? It will. Um, it, it'll, you know, make very microscopic hinges in the fly line where if that line was all one piece, you know, it would definitely go through the guides much, much easier. When it starts to crack and wear down, it's going to uh, basically trap dirt much easier so it won't float as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why that can happen, but... I mean, I fished lines for years just because I, you know, was not, I, I just didn't know like what the breakdown and what was normal in a fly line. If it still functions and, and it still floats for you and it casts fine, you know, keep using it. That's um, right. You know, there's obviously a point in time when you do need a new fly line. So, uh, and I noticed I've seen it both ways. I've had, you know, I've had some lines, uh, you know, both trout and like spay lines where I kind of liked it when they broke down. They got all, you know, they almost or became like almost like an intermediate line, like it sunk a little bit. I just, you know what I mean? But the thing I've, I mean, I've, I probably push it way too far, but I've used some kind of really heavily used. The funny thing is, is this is a kind of an embarrassing story, but I was going through the FFI casting certification uh, a number mm-hmm. of years ago and I was out there casting, trying to hit, you know, hit my marker, doing whatever. And Man, I think I was just struggling. I can't remember what it was, but struggling. And the casting instructor came over, and he took a look at my rod and casting. And I, he gave me his rod, and I cast that thing. It was just like holy crap, and I was just on it. You know, it felt great. I was it, it just, and it was obviously it was the it was the line. It was like it needed to be cleaned. It needed a new line, and right there, you know what I mean. So I I, I realized the effects uh, on my casting, and it was pretty dramatic there. But I, I guess it depends on how much you use it. Sure. Sure. Yeah. It, uh, the fly line definitely is the number one, uh, I think the number one reason to have a successful day on the water. Yeah. Um, you can have, you can have a very expensive reel, a very expensive rod, uh, the best waiters, the best leaders and tip it. But if your fly line does not match that rod 
and it's not performing correctly, you know, uh, you can only do as well as your fly line is going to do. Cause that's the, you know, the difference between, you know, you and that fish is, is getting that fly line there, um, effectively. Yeah. Is there any, uh, you know, as far as taking care of the line, is there anything else other than, I mean, do you guys recommend, uh, cleaning the line, you know, how, how regular, I guess if salt water would be different, but if you're just talking about trout fishing, you know, should you just once a year be going through and cleaning your line or what do you recommend there? Yeah. I mean, it, it varies on, 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 like I said, the, the water type that you're fishing is, as well as how much you're fishing. Uh, definitely before the season, give it a good cleaning, you know, maybe if you're fishing a few times a week, you know, every once a month, you know, give it, give it a good cleaning. If you're only going out, you know, once a month or so, you're probably good for the entire year. Um, you know, it really depends on if you're fishing in a drift boat, you know, every time you lay that line down in the boat, mm. it's going to pick some dirt versus if you're waist deep in the water, um, it's going to stay, you know, a little more clean for you. Yeah. So, you know, I always tell guys, I, I, I've heard stories, you know, cause I I've done customer service questions. I still do customer service questions that guys say, I cleaned it with hot soapy water and it's just not the same line. I just, I've heard hot soapy water so many times and lines not working out. I definitely do not recommend doing that. No. Uh, what about you know, warm I, or warm soapy or cold soapy water? I just I just do not recommend soap whatsoever. Yeah. Um, you know, as long as you could take that line, strip it into a a, a nice clean uh, bucket of water, just straight water, um, and then grab a, a dry rag and run it through the rag, and you'll see the dirt come right off it. And then after that, when the line's dry, that's when I put the line cleaning uh, rejuvenator, which is a silicone wipe over the top of it. It seals out dirt, adds a little bit of slickness to it, and, and you're good to go. Yeah, gotcha. So basically, yeah, run it through twice. So run it through with the just water or whatever, or use a, a nice soft rag, clean it off, and then go through with your um, your pads you guys have. Correct. Correct. Cool, cool. I'll put a link in the show notes to those pads and anything else we talk about today as well so people can – click over and uh, check it out. Let's jump in uh, quickly to, you know, like I said, to start the tarpon because this is, uh, you know, and I, and I think uh, I see a picture of you with the saltwater fish here too. So I, I imagine you, 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 uh, you're excited about the, some of those species, but for me, it's new. Uh, you know, this will be my first tarpon trip and, and I've heard a lot of people talk about tarpon as the number one species, you know, if you had to go for one for the rest of your life sort of thing. What, what do we need to know about choosing a tarpon or maybe just want to talk generally about saltwater lines? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I would totally agree uh, as far as tarpon being. Uh, I'm I'm obsessed with tarpon fishing. Although I live in upstate New York and I only get to go maybe once a year. Hmm. Um, I remember my first trip down to the Keys maybe six years ago, and ever since then, I've just been absolutely obsessed with fishing for those things. Um, it's it's you, you you have to be a good angler. You have to. Uh, it's a grind. Um, it is an absolute grind. Uh, you know, those fish, sometimes they just don't swim. And even if they're swimming really well, they're they're they to, to feed a small fly or a large fly to, you know, to a tarpon, you know, it's tricky. Um, and the, 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 the wear and tear of, of the gear, um, is incredible. You have to have a really good rod. You have to have a really good reel with a drag system. Your fly line has to be dialed. Your leader has to be dialed. The bite guard, um, you you have to have really good backing, um, you have to have good pair of polarized glasses so you can see the fish. Um, and you got to have a good guy that's going to put you in a good spot to get them. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I've been down to Florida. I've fished all over Florida for tarpon. Um, I've been very successful. Um, I'm very lucky that I get to go with some really good guys. But, yeah, uh, you know, as far as fly lines go and tarpon fishing, um, <clears throat> You know, like I mentioned before, our number one selling tarpon line is the Liquid Crystal Clear. It's a full clear floating fly line. Um, what's nice about that is, you know, when you're you're throwing to, you know, big pods of schooled up fish that are swimming through, you know, that it the line's clear. So if if you need, you know, if you overshoot and you put it in that school, that you know, the chances of spooking that school, uh, it, it goes way down with the clear line. Um, it's, it's built out of polyethylene, so it has very low stretch. Um, it's super durable. 
and it's it's got a, a a very slick jacket to it so it's it's great to cast you know especially in extreme heat which is pretty much a guarantee when you're fishing down in florida when those fish start to swim so um that line does really well uh the ghost tip nine which is a nine foot clear intermediate tip uh with floating head and running line behind it that's an awesome line for fishing, you know, bridges, heavier currents, um, or just when fish are swimming a little bit deeper. Um, so those are definitely our two main lines when it comes to that. Um, and we also sell a, a Tropic Plus Tarpon line, which is a, a PVC coated fly line. Uh, it's a two color line. It's new for this year. Uh, it's offered in a seven through 12 weight. Um, that's, that's also one thing about tarpon. I mean, you can target small little tarpon, you know, medium sized tarpon all the way up to, you know, 150, 200 pound tarpon. Um, it really, depends, you know, it depends on where you are in Florida. What if you're heading to, uh, like, uh, more of a, like Tarponville or some of those other stuff out in, you know, uh, kind of over, you know, more South than over, uh, well, I guess they're both South, but yeah, I mean, it depends on what you're going to be fishing for. I mean, if you're fishing for, you know, uh, you know, if you're in the keys and you're fishing to those fish that are going to swim the ocean that are coming in from the Gulf, those are going to be big fish, you know, 60 to, you know, 160 pounds. It's going to vary, you know, it, you know, even the fish with, within that school, but most of those mm -hmm. fish are, are, are big versus, you know, I've, I fished in, um, you know, the banana river around Cocoa beach, uh, Sebastian inlet, you know, places like that on the East coast of, of Florida you get a lot of smaller fish, you know, in, in the 10 to 30 pound range. Those are fun fish to fight on, you know, seven, eight, and nine weights. But if you're targeting big adult fish, um, you know, if you're yeah. in the Everglades yeah. and in the Keys, I mean, minimum 10 weight, minimum 10 weight. Yep. So that's it. So, yeah. So a good all around. If you're to say you're maybe going to be doing, yeah, I guess it depends. Yeah. Minimum 10 weight. But if you're, if you were doing more of some of the baby tarpon, would a 10 weight still be okay? I think it'd be a little overkill. I mean, I've, I've landed fish that were up to a hundred pounds on a nine weight just because we weren't targeting a large fish. It just happened to swim up and, and eat the fly. So it can be done. It is grueling when you're yeah. a big fish on a light rod, but you know, the smaller fish, like I said, you know, 10 to 30 pounders, those are awesome on seven to nine weights there. It's perfect. On a hundred pound fish, how long did that fish take to get in? Uh, that one took about twenty five minutes, maybe twenty minutes. Um, again, I'm 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 a country boy from upstate New York, so whooping on a big tarpon is not my forte. Versus some of the other guys that I go down there with, they just know how to put the wood to those fish. Um, yeah, you know, and it's 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 a game putting those fish down. You know, fighting those fish with the butt section of the rod um, is key. Um, you know, putting the most pressure on those fish with the butt section of the rod, that's how you're going to get those fish to turn and come in quicker. Um, yeah. you know, the, the, the first few large adult tarpon that I've landed, those fights were long and grueling. I didn't know what I was doing. Now I understand, you know, how to fight them a little bit better, uh, point the rod straight at them and pull straight back as hard as you can with the pressure in the butt section. You definitely, you, you whoop them quicker. Um, it's better for the fish to get them in quicker. Um, do you guys have tarpon? Do you, do you guys have uh, what? What do your rod series look like? Do you have, do you have tarpon rods? Uh, we don't. Um, yeah. You know, right now our, our main focus is the is the Euro Nymph fly rods. We do very well with them, and then you know we have uh, a range, like I said, in in the Fair Play series, those entry level rods. Um, but I've I've used a handful of brands uh, when it comes to tarpon fishing. There's a lot of great rod companies in the U.S. and they all make really good rods for tarpon fishing. So. Yeah, I've just been lucky to go out with, um, you know, a bunch of different guys in, in different areas. They all associate with different brands. So I've been lucky to be able to use, you know, five, six, seven different uh, brands of rods for tarpon fishing. And it's it's fun, you know, throwing Cortland lines on different rods and, you know, seeing seeing the different uh, performances in, in each one. Yeah. What, what if and maybe we just uh walk through a few other species that you guys focus on there with your lions. But I just think about another company, uh, Temple Fork Outfitters. If I say I had, if we go back to the trout fishing, say I had a six weight, um, you know, like a nine foot six weight uh, rod. And I was kind of thinking of trout fishing, maybe thinking of uh, an all around trout rod. What, what line would be, would you recommend for that rod? A nine foot six weight. Um, TFO makes some great rods. You know, they've, they've done extremely well with the BBK rod over the years. 
They came up with mm-hmm. some new rods this year that are really nice. Um, I'd say TFO rods are a little more true to size. Um, you know, I would definitely pair up. Again, depends on what you're fishing. You're going to take your nine foot six out for uh, streamer fishing. I recommend uh, the the new streamer line we introduced last year. Um, yeah. What if I was trying to push it and go for? Uh, I mean, I guess dry dry flies might it might be a little on the heavier side, but if I was trying to maybe I was doing some like salmon flies, some bigger dry flies. Sure, I mean out out west, you know, a nine foot six weight is a super popular rod. When you consider places like you know the Missouri River, those trout, I mean, you're talking nineteen, twenty, twenty one inch trout, you know, regularly. So those those fish and they fight super hard. I mean, they're well deserving of a six weight. Um, you know, I I definitely recommend our trout boss line. Uh, when it comes to that, it, it shoots really well. It's a shorter taper. It's versatile. Um, you know, you can throw indicators, you can throw drives, you can throw small streamers. Um, it's not going to overpower, uh, that, you know, that TFO rod you have, and it's going to, it's going to load up, uh, you know, perfect for you. Yeah. So that's, that's how I would pair those together. Again, depends on, uh, what you're going to be doing, uh, whether it's streamers, drives, indicators and, and what have you. So, okay. How often are you, do people should be, th- be thinking about, you know, lining up a, a, a line on a rod? You know what I mean? Like if it's, you got a five weight, throwing a six weight line, is that something that people are doing a lot? They are. Um, and there's two reasons for that. I mean, if you are not a great caster, it helps to overload that rod. It gives you more feel and understanding of what that rod is supposed to feel like when it loads up. Um, and by that, I mean, when it loads up, it really helps your cast and your shootability. So, I mean, if you're a, you know, beginning angler um, and you don't know how to double haul or haul and create line speed, having a little bit of an overweighted fly line is 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 a good thing. Um, if you are a better caster, um, when it comes to you know hauling and generating line speed, and you're able to load that rod up, um, you know, true line sizes are more ideal. So that's another thing that we try to do, you know, in customer service is you know, understand the angler's ability, understand what rod they have and how they're going to be using it. And that really helps us choose a better fly line for them. So, um, like I said, we make lines that are true sizes, half sizes, full sizes, heavy, um, you know, and, and we're going to help pair that with whatever rod that you have, whether it's a a moderate rod, a fast rod, a super fast rod or the angler's ability. That's right. That's right. You got it. You got it all. Okay. And then, yeah, I guess species wise. So you pretty much have a line, no matter what species anywhere in the world, you guys have a line pretty much focused on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the one line we had been lacking for a while, that's like I mentioned before is a, a big destination travel fishery now is, is the new GT tuna line. Um, that pretty much sealed the deal with lines that, um, you know, yeah. lacking and, and, you know, even, even the jungle fishing has become, very popular, uh, Dorado, uh, you know, tigerfish, any, anything in between there, um, you know, in Central America, um, even Africa, uh, lines that need heavier, stronger cores, um, you know, a little more powerful, short, aggressive tapers to throw larger flies to entice those fish to eat. Um, yeah, wide range of fly lines for a wide range of species. What about, what about Stillwater? I think you guys used to have, I think, didn't you have, wasn't the clear camo one of your lines? Yep. We still have a bunch of new, uh, you know, uh, some new Stillwater lines as well as some existing Stillwater lines. Uh, we sell the ghost tip lines, which are clear intermediate tips. Uh, we sell a three foot, a five foot, a 15 foot ghost tip. We sell a seven foot clear camo intermediate line. We sell a full clear camo line, which is by far our most popular Stillwater line. Yeah, it's a great uh, line. You know, and then we sell lines, uh, floating lines, hover lines, sink tip lines, uh, a handful of intermediate lines with um, tick marks on them, you know, to fish what's called the hang. Uh, there's a lot of different applications as far as still water fishing goes to entice those fish to eat. Um, and it's going to vary. Still water fishing, uh, you know, in the Rockies, Pacific Northwest, a little bit different than, you know, still water fishing, let's say, in the UK. So, um a lot of different lines for, uh, you know, still water fishing in general. Yeah. What about, um, you know, like the, the spay game and the uh, steelhead Atlantic salmon and all that? Sure. And we have, um, short belly spay, 
mid belly spay and long belly, as well as the compact switch, which, which is a, a fully integrated Skagit style head. We do very well with that, um, especially on the Great Lakes fisheries up here, um, you know, Lake Ontario, uh, Michigan, um, you know, Ohio, Steelhead Alley. This is perfect because I just had actually talked to Kevin, or uh, not Kevin, <laughs> um, uh, Jerry Darkus uh, uh, just uh, this week. And um, we were talking about the Great Lakes. He covered uh, like a lot of the background, and we talked about the switch rods. So this is this is kind of perfect. So what would be if somebody was going to one of those medium sized rivers and, and they needed they had a switch rod, say eleven, you know, eleven and a half foot little switch. Is it that com that that line the compact switch? Yeah, I absolutely I steer guys in that direction all the time. I mean, I, that's the way. You know, I personally fish that way with eleven, eleven and a half foot, six, seven, or eight weight, depending on the steelhead. Uh, that you're targeting the steelhead in Lake Ontario, where we are in New York, they're a little bit bigger versus some of the steelhead that come out of uh, Lake Erie. Um, so, you know, somewhere between an 11 and a, 11 and a half foot, um, six weight or seven weight, it's usually pretty ideal. The compact switch is awesome. I mean, it's about, uh, I think a 26 to 28 foot uh, head design integrated into uh, a running line. It's awesome to pair with, uh, you know, sink tips, whether they're light or heavy, um, you know, as well as long tapered leaders. So, um, it's going to vary, uh, on, on the rivers that you're fishing, uh, whether they're, you know, big, deep, fast, slow, or shallow. Um, there's so many different waterways uh, on the, on the great lakes as yeah. a whole, but that line, you can manipulate that line by the tip that you put on it. So I definitely yeah. steer guys in that direction for that fly line. It's just versatile. Um, you know, and it's and it's bulletproof as far as its uh, its casting ability. It's it's a great line. Cool. All right. Well, let's see. And and I guess one other note, just on the color, right? Because color is is a thing. There's lots of different colors. Does that uh, matter at all when people are choosing a line? Let's go back to the trout, like uh, you know, the peach line or whatever. Does does color matter? It matters to some people, and it and it doesn't matter to others. Does the do the fish care? I think they do. I think. Uh, yeah. I I think depending on your fishery and depending on your backdrop. What, what about your Delaware? If we take it to the Delaware, uh, you know, uh, right back to your, you, you mentioned the East and, you know, kind of whatever you want. To, is Does it matter there? I think so. I, I, I definitely choose natural colored fly lines over a bright colored fly line. Um, yeah. You know, the majority of the time you're fishing, you have dark green trees as your backdrop. You know, olive moss colored fly lines tend to blend in when you're false casting. Um, they definitely, uh, I, I think they make a difference. I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking it. I know guys out West, you know, in the, in the Rockies, uh, we, we saw a lot more high vis lines out there. Um, the fisheries just set up a little bit different. Um, you know, it depends on how pressured your fishery is. Uh, some fish, it doesn't matter. Some fish, it does. Um, me mentally, yeah. I, I like to try to be as stealthy as possible. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's no reason to. Uh, that seems to be the thing. I guess visibility, seeing your line, you know, you want to sometimes see it. Sure. Uh, I guess, you know, the clear camo doesn't really matter because you're sinking down. There's certain lines that doesn't. But um, yeah, I think it's, and then it's personal preference, right? Do you want, some people want a cool, crazy looking line mixed up with their crazy looking reel, right? To, to make it look kind of cool. That definitely is becoming more and more popular, you know, backing colors, line colors. Um, you yep. know, it's it's definitely getting to that point where guys are just kind of picking lines. They they can fool a fish no matter what colored line they have, and they want to have something. I mean, you're spending exactly. good quality money on you know expensive gear, uh, rods, backing, and lines. And man, if that you know if that's what you want, you want something that looks good, and and you want it to look a certain way. We we make them in all different colors for you. So uh, yeah, you know, no, cool. you guys have it covered. Yeah, uh, <laughs> lines, peach lines, you know, blue lines, olive lines, all different colored backing. The real companies have been doing uh, an incredible job coming out, coming out with different colored reels. And definitely the, the anglers, customers, they appreciate it. I see all sorts of different colored stuff when I'm on the water, uh, both, you know, real line and backing colors. Um, it's, yeah. all, it's all personal preference. What do you think is the next? Uh, you, we've talked about the the Euro nymphing, you know, which actually isn't a new thing, uh, really. I mean, the the the, the kind of the nymphing without an indicator, um, 
you know, that's been going on for a long time. But I mean, what do you think is the next craze? Do you guys, and how do you guys stay ahead of the, ahead of the puck, so to speak? You know what I mean? Like how, how do you, you know, in the next year or so, how do you make sure that you're, you know, you're not falling behind or well, you're leading? Yeah, no, you definitely have to have, um, boots on the ground. Um, whether it's your ambassadors, your pro staff, you know, the group in the office, you got to have a team of fishy guys that, you know, live and breathe it every single day. Um, and if you can see the trends that are coming, um, and get ahead of those, you know, that's the key to success to be, you know, really a couple of the first brands that are getting into it. I think Cortland's done a great job with the Euro nymphing stuff. Um, you know, having, uh, that being, you know, we, we love to Euro nymph guys at Cortland. That's what we do. We love it. It's great. Um, I mean, we'll fish any way we need to. However, um, the Euro nymphing stuff, I, I definitely think it's, it's here to stay. It, uh, it's, it's not going to come and go. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll use the Tenkara for example. I mean, that was yeah. huge, you know, for a little while it's, it's since faded away. I've only seen Euro nymphing continue to grow. Um, we got into it yeah. really heavily, you know, when I had first started at Cortland about eight years ago, we've only added to that assortment, um, you know, and it's just more and more guys getting into it. And even, uh, you know, the older generation of guys that have always just, you know, dry fly fished or swung wet flies or small streamers, they see guys catching more fish, um, tight line or Euro nymphing, however you want to call it. Yeah. Who, who's your Euro guy? Who, who's your? You guys have a a big player in the Euro game, right? One of your ambassadors. Um, man, there's uh, there's so you got a bunch. There's so many. Yeah, both both here in the U.S. and internationally. And uh, oh, right. You know, we really rely on those guys um, for feedback. And and like I said, the 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 team of guys at Cortland. Um, you know, that's that's what we like to do. Uh, you know, day in and day out when we can hit the water. So. Yeah, um, that's cool. There's small little trends within Euro nymphing, um, you know, not just Euro nymphing as a whole. So um, just staying ahead of the game, you know, you have to rely on your your boots on the ground, like I said before, to stay ahead of the game. And uh, what the next craze is, well, I, that's a secret. I, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you can't. Those are trade trade secrets. I mean, you, I mean, obviously the fly lines is. I mean, like you said, that's the crazy thing is that there are the new crazes. But like you said, your best selling line is the four forty four, and that says a lot about the, the new craze, right? Yeah, it's it's funny. Um, it's just those customers that have always fished that line, they continue to buy it. Now, you know, their son and grandson is getting into fly fishing, and they say, "Listen, you know, this is what's worked for me." Those guys buy it, and it's kind of a new wave of people getting into the peach lines. Um, huh. Again, that's awesome. They work, and uh, you know, guys just want quality gear that works. And yeah, um, you know, that's the biggest uh, aspect of that line is it's a fifty nine dollar retail line, and it, it's a it's a phenomenal fly line for a lot of different reasons, it, it, regardless of of how you're going to target fish. So. Yeah. Um, 50 bucks is a good, 50 yeah. bucks is a good, uh, price point. Can't go wrong. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. What about, you know, just for fly lines, is there a, like a resource if somebody wanted to take this further, maybe learn more about fly lines? Is there anything like books, magazines, uh, you know, videos, anything that you can think of or, you know, if, aside from calling you guys, is there anything out there? Yeah. There's a ton of great books out there right now. Um, you know, guys like George Daniel, he writes some incredible oh, yeah. stuff. I mean, that guy is super fishy. Um, very, he's, he's, he's a wonderful guy. He's a great person. He's super smart when it comes to this stuff. There's some great DVDs out there. Uh, guys like Lance Egan and Devin Olson put together an incredible uh, DVD uh, for Euro nymphing as well as some other stuff. Um you know, guys like uh, Matt Sapinski in in Michigan writes some some really great books. Well, as far as you know, and I guess if you take it just to line, I mean, have we, you know, the lines itself, fly lines? I mean, have we talked about everything you need to know today about fly lines, or is there other stuff that people might, if they wanted to get nerdy on it and and understand more about lines, is there anything else out there? You 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 can get as nerdy as you want to get when it comes to fly lines. Um, you know, talking about uh, densities, um, 
you know, diameters, uh, different jacket material, whether it's uh, different plastics used, um, cores, whether it's a braided core, whether it's a braided monocore, a monocore. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's so many ins and outs of fly lines um, and how they're used. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, it's a lot. You, you know, getting getting nerdy. Yeah, it's it's never ending. I mean, we get questions at Cortland right from the basic, basic stuff all the way to the super techie stuff. Um, you know, some of these, there's some guys out there that are, are really taking it to the next step. And, uh, you know, we just encourage you to send us an email if you want to, you know, we'll take it as far as you want to go. If it's a basic question all the way up to, you know, what is the diameter 13 feet in on your compact switch six weight, we can get you that answer. Um, cool. and some guys cool. want to know that. So, yeah. That's what's great about us. So um, that's right. We encourage. That's right. That. Well, I'll leave, I'll leave it out here on one. This one maybe is a little deep one, but um, you know, since you've been there eight or nine years, anything you know comes to mind about kind of a, a big failure you've had working for Cortland? It seems like that you know we all have struggles along the way. Any any big things come to mind? Something you messed up on or, or anything like that you want to well, highlight here? Maybe you know just the lack of knowledge when I had first started. Uh, I took over Cortland social media about four years in, uh, to working. Like I said, I had started at Cortland manufacturing fly line. I tell you what, when you work at someone like a uh, place like Cortland, you get brought up to speed very quickly on, on pretty much everything associated with fishing. And hmm. when I had started the social media, I didn't know, uh, a redfish from a snook. Oh, right. I mean, I, I could tell you every species that exists now, but yeah, when I first started, I, I was literally Google searching what a snook and a redfish look like. So, did, did you ever did you ever make some posts out there? Could we, we could probably go back and see it where you screwed up and somebody I, called I, you out. I, I guarantee I deleted it at this point. But oh, uh, you deleted it. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> you know, listen, there's a lot of keyboard muscles out there, and you get blasted for for calling a smallmouth a largemouth, or yeah, you know, vice versa. But yeah, uh, failure. Um, <laughs> Nothing too yeah. significant, but yes, understanding the species when I had first taken over social media, I mean, I would get sent photos from guys in Florida and I'd have to Google a redfish or a snook because I didn't know what they yeah. were. And yeah. I mean, I've come a long way since then, um, you know, and, and, you know, social media, it's, it's cut through, it's crazy out there and you better not be wrong when it comes to social media. And, uh, yeah. I've, I've definitely yeah. learned over time, uh, species and where they exist. And, uh, yeah, like I said, you get brought up to speed real quick working for Cortland, especially doing the social media. I don't do the social media anymore. Um, thank God because it is extremely demanding. Now we have a couple guys that do it at Cortland and they're, and they're great at it. Um, yeah. So I'd, I'd like to keep it that way for a little while. Nice, nice. All right, Brooks. Well, hey, that's all I have for you. Um, I'll let you get out of here. Just wanted to, wanted to thank you for coming on and sharing, uh, you know, some some of the history and background. And it's it's cool to talk to you and, and make the connection to Cortland because, like I said, I've pretty much my whole life, uh, you know, I've been using Cortland stuff. So it's awesome to to hear the story and have a chance to to highlight what you guys are doing. Fantastic, Dave. Thanks for having me on today. I, I really enjoyed it. And like I said before. Um, if any of the listeners out there, if you guys have any questions, regardless of what it is, just shoot us an email at info at courtlandline.com. Uh, we got a great group of guys at Cortland. We'll answer anything that you guys have. Um, encourage you guys to check out our website, courtlandline.com. There's a lot of good stuff there as well. Um, and uh, in tight lines, good luck on your next trip. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 171. If you get a chance, please share this episode with one other person that you could uh, that you think could use a blast of dry fly knowledge today and uh, maybe a little bit of uh, insider tips on fly lines. And press a pause if you can right now. Head over there and just share it up. Thanks again for stopping by the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon. I hope to maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.